Hi, my name is Richard Bilderbeek and my talk is called Open Science and Scientists Being Human. Then you can download the presentation at this URL, um, it's in the last slide as well. So before I discuss open science and scientists and them being human, let's first discuss science as it is. So when I think about science, I think about scientists and I think about knowledge and experiments. And to make more explicit, this is how I f feel it would look like a bit. Uh, so when I think about science, I think about knowledge. Knowledge is acquired by doing experiments. Scientists do those experiments. Um, for, an ex for knowledge to be true, or for knowledge to be likely to be true, we need to repeat those experiments and find them again and again and again, those results. When those experiments have a nice result, something statistically significant, which means that the result is unlikely to be due to chance, um, the when, so when an experiment is significant, a scientist can publish this, it's, it's likelier to get it published. And scientists like to publish articles because that's good for their career. So already here in this slide I already laid out uh, the structure of my talk a bit and in the red lines um, you see where open science can improve because scientists are, tempt are, are really encouraged to publish a lot of papers and to find significant findings. So let's take a look at Gunwald. Gunwald, he is a scientist. So here we have him at the right, we see Gunwald and uh, so he's a scientist and he's, uh, he's uh, he, he found some data here at the left um, all the data I show you from Gunwald there is no effect at all in them I just simulated this just by drawing random numbers so Gunwald he measured a lot of women of a certain length and he made a plot in which you have at the x-axis the horizontal axis the length of those women and the at the y-axis the amount of women with that height it's called a histogram um, and then you see in the middle that there's a, there's a peak and here there's less uh, so, so for example this peak is the amount of women at that length so that's 12 women at that length of what, let's say 170 centimeters this dashed line which is a nice curve that's the that's what you would expect to find if you would measure an infinite amount of women um, this is a good approximation of what you would expect to find. Um, what Gunwald measured from these thousand women um, has more ups and downs. It's not as ideal. It's not as perfect. He only, me only measured a thousand women, but this is just by chance, and we accept that. That's a fact of life. And Gunwald, he wants to be interested in finding out why some women are taller than others. Why there are some women that are, that are above 190 and some women below 150. So he's going to do an experiment. So he's going to do a survey for women and he asks them how tall are you? Because mostly women know this, but of course you could also measure this. And then he asks them 20 things uh, in, in an attempt to explain what makes why they are so tall. For example, he asks women, do you prefer red over green? Or is your phone number an even number or is it an odd number uh, and 18 other things so you see all these explaining explanatory values as they're called uh, they have no effect on height just to make sure that you understand that's why I picked them I just make it when I have a very explicit example then um, but you can do such a survey and I will show you how good world will get a publication from this survey uh, because he's very smart, he already measures 20 things, and I'll show you why that is so smart. So in most cases, Gunwald will be unlucky. So here we have uh, the same histogram again, with the uh, women length at the x-axis, the horizontal axis, and the amount of women with that length at the y-axis. But now they are split into two groups, uh, the women that prefer green over red, and the women that prefer red over green in red. Um, so there's a, it's a bit more, it's a bit less pretty, it's a bit noisier. Um, they seem, on by eye, they seem well similar enough. And that's exactly what Gunwald can do. He does a statistical test um, to see if the mean, of, of the mean height of women in one group is different from the other group. 
And this statistical test is called a t-test, will give you something that's called the p-value. And the p-value, if it's zero, it means that that's there's that there's very likely to be really an effect. Really, the green and the red causes the height of women. If the p-value is higher, then we say, well, this is probably chance. And the magic p-value is 5%. So in some fields, but uh, this is biology, so we use 5% here. In the field of biology, we usually use 5% as a, as a cutoff for p-values. If a p-value is below 5%, we say, whoa, this is a significant finding. Here we say that below 5%, here we say, yeah, th there's an... We, we this is an effect. We can say that. When the p-value is 6%, we say there's no effect. Well, it's caused by RAN. We have to pick this threshold somewhere. And when Gunwald does this survey, uh, if he does it a hundred times, uh, this, in five cases he will find an effect. So if he does the survey a hundred times, in 5% of all cases, the same 5% here, that's used as a threshold, in 5% he'll find a significant effect. Grunwald knows this, he knows that the chance to find um, nothing when there's no effect is 95%. But he also knows that there's this chance of 5% to find something significant when nothing happens. So in this case he's a bit sad, he finds nothing significant. But if you do it the survey more often, then sometimes by chance you find a significant effect. So he could probably he find he could find something like this. He knows that there's a chance of five percent that there is no effect. Like this p-value is is very low. Uh, it's it's believe even below 0.1 percent. So this is a significant finding, and he says Eureka as if he's uh, he has been doing some brilliant research. But he knows chance five percent there is no effect. And that brings us to the smartness of Grunwald, or and also the problem. The chance to find something significant when there is no effect at all is 5%. So if you measure 20 things, then you are probably going to find one significant finding, which you can get your publication from. Um, but you can do even more. If you have two things, uh, red, uh, preference for red or green, and your phone number being odd or even, you can combine those two things as well using combined statistical tests. For example, that you say um, for the women that have an only for the women that have an even phone number, then their body length is explained by if they prefer red or green, and you can also do that the other way around. And just me, by doing some sloppy p-value hacking, because that's what it's called, looking for p-values, looking for low p-values, I already got this to 20% if there's no effect, if you have measured two things. So not 10%, 20%. And probably if you're more creative, uh, you can also get that number way more up. Um, if you want to take a sneak peek, there's, this, uh, there's an article here. Uh, there are 36 ways to tweak an experiment. So it's may be very e maybe too easy to get something significant when there is no effect. Grunwald, however, he is very happy because he has his publication. So he finds that women with even phone numbers, and only women with even phone numbers, if they prefer red over green, they are taller. Brilliant finding. Um, and he writes in his paper that he, they always suspected this. They thought, yeah, evolution, we know phones are very recent, even phone numbers on average are higher. Uh, uh, make some kind of evolutionary story from it, that's a good idea for him to do. And he feels so creative uh, when when doing this. Like he, uh, um, also for looking for the low p-values and making up the story. Like it was, it's, it's storytelling. Um, he was he asked the women 20 things in the survey, but he only reported two, which is the phone number and the preference for the core. And that brings us to the next question, is Gunwald evil? So at the moment we would consider Gunwald not to be evil. 
Um, because fraud, that's that's clearly evil. He didn't fabricate data. Um, what he did is more the gray area. We call it dubious research practices or questionable research practices. Those are research practices you can get away with. Um, sometimes you can choose not to do them, but uh, you can do them. And usually you get away with them. Um, why would Grunewald do such thing? And why do other scientists do it? And is that a common? Well, that's a good question. So first, why is Grunewald likelier to do this? What's the most important thing that can cause Grunewald to do this? Well, this has been a research in the Netherlands of thousands of scientists, and they ask, like, why, um, what explains why scientists do this? And the biggest two factors is the first number you need to look at. Um, these are the strength of, of the effect, what, what's causing them to do it. And the top two things are the scientific norm of scientists and the publication pressure that there is. So the scientific norm that would be uh, being a scientist say, yeah, but it's just a game. And, uh, I just make a good story. Science is storytelling. It's encouraged me to do so. It's just uh, the rules. It's what I'm. Um, it's what the grants ask me to do, to get out a lot of papers. And the second thing is the publication pressure. Uh, the mantra is called publish or perish. If you don't publish, you're unlikely to get uh, to continue your career as a scientist. So those are two, two. These are the two most important reasons why scientists do these questionable research practices. But is it common that people do it? Yes, they are very common. Uh, I'll show you just two studies in the next slide, and I'll, I, I, I erased a lot of the the, the the stuff that I don't have time to talk about. But there at the left we have a study in ecology and evolution. How and more than 50% of all cases uh, of s of articles they have unreported variables. That means that they done a survey that has, for example, 20 things, but they only report two. That's exactly what Grunewald did. Um, also, the third thing, harking, that's um, also above 50%. Harking, that means hypothesizing after results are known. So your hypothesis is, is why you do your research. Uh, Grunewald did this like something like, yeah, evolution has caused women with even phone numbers to be something, and hence a preference for love is expected. So he makes a nice round story from because then he does his results and his results confirm what he thought at the start. Um, but it would be better if he would first time write down what he thought before seeing the results. So he can't uh, spin the story from the results. Um, and there's another study uh, that has uh, a similar and way higher values even. I, I don't know exactly the details of the second study, but um, uh, I think it's like a meta some reviews in different fields. And it's a problem that scientists do this. Like 50% of scientists cannot reproduce their own work, so when they do this experiment again, one in two cases, they can't reproduce it. Um, and I think that's already a very high number here. Uh, and one in nine preclinical cancer studies could be replicated. So that means eight out of nine studies it could not be replicated. Well, there are many reasons for these numbers, and one of them could be, uh, is likely to be, that people have been p-value hacking to get results, to publish something that has, that when there's no effect, as a significant effect. And the European Union and the UNESCO, uh, they acknowledge this problem, and they think open science can solve this. Um, they have bi wider ideas about open science and can solve more things according to them. I'll only focus on, on this part of the problem. So this brings us to what is open science. Now, well, so this is a, from a slide from UNESCO. And open science is a lot of things with the word open on it. And I'll focus on, at the top right, we see open engagement of social actors. I'll discuss that last. Um, at the bottom left, we see open science infrastructures. Um, that means to put things in place in science, how scientists work, so they can do open science and are rewarded for that. Um, and th because the goal of that is to get reproducible science. And I'm not going to 
Um, so there has been a study, what are the best ways to get reproducible science, and this ties in nicely with these open science infrastructures. So there's a study about um, what would be best for getting reproducible science. And I, I've grayed out a lot of stuff, but in the right column, uh, first two lines you see registered report and the open science framework. Um, and the registered report is exactly what I'll be talking about now, b because that is what would made Gunwald more humble in his findings. So first we'll start with a cartoon of the registered report. So here at the left we see traditional research, and at the right we see some kind of pyramid being built, and that is a, a, a registered uh, report. And it already gives the impression that at the left the scientists are just messing around a bit, changing the story, looking for p-values and, and all the things, and in the end uh, it gets uh, you have your your published result. I said the right, it looks more structured, and the most important thing already we can see here that there's stage there are two stages. Stage one is a plan that gets reviewed. Stage two are the results, and those get reviewed. Uh, and then they get their publications. Um, I'll zoom in more on registered reports just to just to make sure uh, it's, it's this is more the chronological order. So you have your ideas about women heights, for example, and then you're going to design your study. Like we hypothesize that, or in in this case, uh, in Gunwald's case, we uh, we have no idea. We think there is no. I would say there is no effect, but we're going to analyze it anyways. Uh, but we're going to do a lot of tests, so maybe we're not going to use 5% as a p-value, but we correct for a lot of testing. It's called a Bonferroni correction, you can do that. So if we, when we are more st strict in our test, then what will be an effect will be an effect. Or is likely to be an effect. And that is the beauty. So that thing, uh, you write down your study design without having any results, also your hypothesis. And that gets reviewed. It, it, and the review is about, like, is this a good experiment? Is this a good piece of research? And if you pass this review, it's the strictest review of the of the two, then the journals can say, the journal that you submitted your paper to will say, you now go do that experiment, and whatever comes out of it will publish the result. If it's significant or not, we'll publish it. So then you po then you go you going to collect and analyze your data. You're going to write down your report. This gets reviewed, but it's mostly a check if you really stuck to your original design, if you kept your promise, and then it's published. So the idea is that you don't you cannot uh, bullshit anymore, and you have to report more honestly. So um, here's a here's a finding already um, where they combined. Experiments reported in the traditional literature at the right, and at the left findings in registered reports. And this is only about replication research. So they try to replicate something from the traditional literature. And the height of these dots are the percentage of null findings. So the percentage that they did not find something significant, that they found no effect. In the traditional literature, this is around 15%, whereas for the registered reports, it's around 65%. Uh, so it appears that if people report more honestly, you find well, fewer effects. Um, open science gives better papers in general, but I'm going to skip this because I want to focus on the conclusion that open science can help to find true and reproducible knowledge and to report finding no effect more honestly. It has its problems as well, it's more time and work, and there are no rewards strongly in place yet, although for example the European Union is working on that. Now finally I want to talk about Open Science Uppsala. So there is a community, an Open Science community in Uppsala, called Open Science Uppsala, and um, they meet once a month in this central library and everyone is welcome. Uh, that's part of open science as well, to be open for everyone. So that brings me to my conclusion. So this normally I would ask you for questions, but this is a YouTube presentation. So um, you can't. Again, you can find the presentation here.